GIT Warriors. I'm Dale Pinkert and you're in face. Welcome investing.com. Thank you for joining us today. We hope to edify you with some looks, technical, covering all instruments. We look at everything. I know that we have FX on our handle, but we cover commodities, we cover indexes, we cover bonds. So we cover the globe and we cover almost every instrument possible. Let's get to the markets. Uh, yesterday, we had that big recovery. Before it happened, I talked about um, a glaring divergence in the NASDAQ at new lows here. And we had a Larry Kudlow low. He came out and stabilized the market. I don't think it'll be as long lasting of a low as a Mark Haynes bottom was at 666 in the S&Ps. But uh, he did calm down the market. So uh, this is, uh, that's what, you know, happened yesterday. From here, I think it's uh, a little bit pat. Uh, there, everyone feels pretty good about the lows being in. And in fact, yesterday in NASDAQ, I talked about uh, during some of my intelligence gathering, uh, some of, because I've interviewed almost a thousand traders and I know who's pretty good. And I could tell by their past forecasts that, they give me it gives them credibility, so I pay attention. And one of them uh, is actually looking for a new high in Nasdaq. Was calling this bottom here. I talked about it at the beginning of phase yesterday. And uh, those have been following me for a while. They would actually set up a third drive to a top up here. So uh, you know that's a possibility. But where do you know you're wrong? Of course, we could say under yesterday's low, there's going to be problems. But something else I showed yesterday was uh, the demarcation line in the VIX up here, about 25 and a half, which it was turned back from, even with the 500 point lower opening. We didn't even get there. So I would say if you start seeing prints at 26 on the VIX, that you have to get out of the way of equities because uh, it could be. A significant type of breakout. You could call it an ascending triangle. You could call it a head and shoulders, left shoulder, head, right shoulder. And it's still possible that we don't go to new lows. And even though the market could recover, it would in fact be very bearish if uh, we didn't take out this low and NASDAQ made a new high. So um, we'll take a look at this. But it's very good to have a line in the sand. In fact, bull bear lines, it's part of the package for our subscribers here. We always talk about a bull bear line in every instrument that we cover. It's in this column. So if you're fading trends and you're looking for turns, this is where you have to abandon that because the difference between pros and amateurs are pros know how to lose, so they have money left to be right with. If you're in our webinar right now, I encourage you to take the trial 10 days for one buck, test drive our traffic light page so you're not running red lights and you look for greens and confluence between different analysts with different methods. For example, uh, let's look at the Aussie lot. You know, we we saw it hit major support and try and recover. So this is the look that we're getting from Grega Horvat, who's an award-winning Elliotitian from FX Street. In fact, we're award-winning. We were best new contributor on FX Street this year proud of the team and the great work that they do. So Greg are looking for a push down actually to new lows here and could take us down, looks about 75.70. But if you want to comp different kinds of work, say that's not your bag and you're into harmonics or basic technical, you get the different charts. You get candlestick and you get the macro view. So I encourage you, it's a dollar to test drive our traffic light page. A very nice education section as well in our uh, website. So a couple, one, one other thing I want to talk about is we were constructive on the US dollar yen from the third drive to a top. We're attacking the 50 day moving average. Yesterday, I talked about it could either just go right to 107 and a half or we could have had an ABC, but 
as long as the yen is maintaining the spare market rally, it should be constructive. For equities, if you see it turn back down and start to take out, say 105.70, I think that would be your first danger sign here. And we're even giving it the possibility just for a bear market rally to get back to 109, 110. Uh, looking at oil, we have that bounce yesterday, not much follow through. I'd say yesterday's low is pretty key in the crude. And if we start taking out the 62, I think you could make a, a case for these lows being taken out. In fact, probably the biggest prize would be this being a double top, as Steve Volge has noted, and we getting some type of FIB extension of this move from here. That could take you down to 56, and that would still be corrective territory after this big advance, and I'd have a bushel basket out if we got down here, especially with John Bolton in the administration and the very high potential that uh, the Iran nuclear deal we're going to uh, not certify. So uh, keep an eye on that if we get one good break down there to 55, because I think there is potential for problems in the Middle East this summer, this fall. And Aussie Kiwi, uh, I'm looking for one more low. It looks like we're going to get it now. So we have that we have that bounce to 560 and the four hour, even at new lows, I'm figuring 520 to 105. It's going to look pretty good. I would bet that if we take out this low, and I thought it would, part of my work is confirmed highs and lows. The break here in Aussie was confirmed on the one hour. If we take out these lows, uh, well, this is Aussie Kiwi, um, down towards 105, that would diverge. And as well, I did share Greg's look on Aussie. So let's, I think that is probably the time to key in on Aussie Kiwi is down there at Greg's targets. And it's still possible that we get one more shot down, clean out stops here. That's why I'm Forex Stop Hunter. I think they, uh, you know, after this, there could be some nice uh, recoveries to take out buy stops, but I think there's sell stops here, sell stops here, and definitely the grand prize is right here at 76.43 in Aussie. That's where everyone has their stops. People say, Dale, how do you know where the stops are? Well, all you have to do is say, look, if I was along this market, where would I put my stop? And the answer you come up with is where everyone else's are as well. So uh, we have a great guest today, Chris Carolyn. Uh, he gained a lot of notoriety in his early days. He is with Robert Prechter. He does a spiral calendar. It's going to be a great time to talk to Chris and see what's on his radar or what he's seeing through his telescope with all the volatility we've seen in equities and in uh, currencies have been fairly tame in this environment. Most of the volatility is in the stock market. And I look forward to getting Chris's views on that, as well as gold. Gold failed yesterday from the 500-point lower opening in the market. Gold came in sharply higher. I think it was up 14 bucks at one point. And I'm going to show you, just in case you're not around for when it happens, where I'd be very interested in um, doing something in gold. And it's going to be after we wash out this low of 1300 and trade maybe 61.8 back of this advance 1290 and while that's happening i do expect a break under 16 dollars in the silver i know someone talking 1550 if you want to be real bear if you look at the weekly and you'll see a convergence of wedge lines coming in all the way down at 1470. So the 78.6 mark is 15.26 of this big advance we had a couple years ago. But I do believe there's going to be a tradable low down here in the coming weeks, and I will be stalking it. Blake, how are you this morning? What's on the agenda for you today? I'm doing well, Dale. How are you doing? Good, buddy. Good, buddy. Uh, yeah, I know, you know, the big day is tomorrow, I, you know. What you, I, I really don't do a lot before the NFP because to me it's kind of like roulette. So uh, what are you thinking going into what should be a pretty critical number 
based upon what's going on in the markets? Yeah, you know, um, well, for, first and foremost, uh, it, 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 I, I do expect a pretty slow day today. I mean, the um, the 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 fact that it is you know pre non farm payroll, we had just major volatility yesterday. Um, probably is going to keep um, the market fairly tame. However, um, I you know I'm looking at the cable and and you know this pound. So we're back below this trend line. And here, let me draw something for you guys really quick. Um, you have to imagine yesterday. Yeah, see this, look like see this candle right here. Down. Yeah. Yeah. See, this was red at, at one point yesterday. We were we were like a bright red candle. We're like, oh, here we go. We're gonna break <laughs> down. Yeah. You know, and then all of a sudden it ripped back up. You know, we 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 hit the support. Uh, I, I even Mark tweeted pulled a few people, didn't he? Yeah, you know, I tweeted I tweeted it out, and and it looked like you know I'm like, okay, we we're really a key support here, and then you know we bounce like you know, hundred pips right after that. So the, the, the question is, you know, are we going to do it today? Now it is the day before non-farm payroll and, and every time every, and I'm, I'm not, well, I may be, be exaggerating here. I'm not every time, but a lot of times when I think, okay, the market's not going to break ahead of non-farm payroll. Uh, and then we break. <laughs> You know what I mean? So just when, cause, cause no one's expecting it, right? No one's expecting um, the pound to break down, not ahead of non-farm payroll. So is it possible that we break lower? I mean, it, 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 it is. I, 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 I'm not going to, you know, start, you know, gunning for shorts here. I think what, what would have to happen and, and I'm just going to draw it out for you guys is I'd, I'd like to see a move below 140 then a pop back up again, and, and then, you know, short it on a retest. What? Hold on, my drawing tool didn't really work the way I wanted it to. And then short it on a retest like that. Dang it, didn't do it again. Um, like this is what I'd be thinking. That's what I would be thinking. Uh, but, but you know, the, 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 if you're long the cable, you've got to be a little nervous. I mean, I, I would be sitting here going, uh, you know, I don't know how comfortable I am being on the, uh, being on the short side or being on the long side of the pound right at this moment in time. So um, I, I think it is a little, a little dangerous. Um, I'm not, like I said, I'm not shorting it here. I'd like to see it clear th through 140, start taking the stops. And then, then, you know, then I know that we are making our way lower um, uh, despite non-farm payroll. And then I, I'd be, then I'd be looking to sell any rally following, you know, non-farm payroll. And the same could be same said for the Euro dollar. If, if you guys, if you guys are trading the Euro, um, it, we're, we're at a very, very critical juncture at this point. This is the, the rally, I mean, this is a four hour chart. I could probably go on a daily chart, it'll be a little bit better. So this is a daily chart from, from the lows uh, in April of 2017. Um, that trend line comes in right 20 pips from where we're at. Uh, you know, are we going to, are we going to break that, you know, support right now? I don't think we are, but you know, like I said, even though it's ahead of non-farm payroll, I wouldn't expect it. But sometimes the market moves ahead of non-farm payroll. But this is such a this isn't like your minor trend line either. This isn't like oh, you know, we're sitting on the, see this is a minor trend line. Uh, and and just for for your knowledge, this is a good this is a good um, opportunity for me to educate you guys a little bit. Um, trend lines or technical analysis just in general is more important when it can be found at multiple test points and long, the longer in duration it is. So for example, um, this Euro dollar, you can see this, ooh, hold on. That's a pearl. Wait, hold on really quick. I'm going to, I got to, Hold on, right. All right, so Blake's talking about this trend line, and it is major because you see it going all the way all the way back to March. Many hits on it. The Bloomberg squad guy, he's chatting as okay. Ass off right now. Go ahead. Sorry, Go ahead. I had to I had to get rid of him. Um, uh, 
uh, what was I saying? Oh, okay. So when when you're talking about the when you're talking about the um, uh, like technical trend lines here, like I'm just I can use the euro as a great example. This is a minor trend line. This red one that we passed through. See, it has one, two, three points. It it, it only spans back a couple of months. So it was a minor trend line. We're be, we're below it. Obviously, we're consolidating below it. But um, uh, the major trend line is. Uh, this one's a year old, okay? It's exactly one year old, and it's got one, two, three, four, now five, 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 you know, uh, air, um, levels of, uh, that we're, we're testing, basically. So multi more multiple touches, longer in duration, it's going to be a major trend line. A anything that spawns back like six months to a year or plus, you know, something like that, uh, those are, those are, pretty key in my in my in my view you know when you're when you when you got a when you got a trend line that comes in and it's just a you know a couple months old yeah it's yeah it's minor i mean we, we break it and you can see that you know the the euro had a little bit of follow through the day that we we sliced through this one i mean you know i shorted the euro i ended up actually believe it or not i took a loss in it i i shorted it at 122.90 uh, I, you know, I wrote it all the way down to the 50 level, and then I, I ended up covering it like like around 97 or something. I I covered it right here, which I pulled the plug a little too early because the market was so volatile. I just didn't want to get stuck in. Um, if you guys can imagine what was happening right around this point, the 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 Dow was dropping, you know, several hundred points or rallying seven several hundred points, and there was massive volatility a couple of days ago, and I'm like. I, I don't want to get stuck in this thing if it whips, you know, through these highs, you know, because when there's when there's so much volatility in equities, it can spill over into currencies. And so you don't want to be, you know, stuck on the wrong side if this thing had whipped up, you know, 100 pips higher. So I, I, I took I took it off. But you can see, uh, well, I guess what I was discussing is this is a minor trend line break. Um, it had a little bit of follow through. We have this you know, break here in the Euro. And if we clear this uh, 122.40 support around here, this then becomes a big, um, in my view, big, big breakdown area. And then, you know, we're gonna see a much larger follow through to the downside uh, regarding the Euro dollar. And, and, and you know, that, that, also, uh, that also is true with the dollar index, because you can look at the dollar index, the dollar index has the same, um, same basic uh, trend line that's been um, now we this one goes a little bit further since March but the same basic trend line is is in play with the um, with the with the dollar index uh, and and as we make our way up towards that um, you know 90 70 91 level which is the previous uh, support that's where that's where the dollar really starts to you know gain some gain some strength from a uh, from a, a you know a squeeze perspective, it, it, it doesn't even have to be in this in this case. It doesn't even have to be, um, uh, you know, a, a macro thing, or you know, it may not have, you know, the the all the right reasons recipe wise to to stage a rally in the dollar. It could be mostly technical and positioning that 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 really squeezes the dollar higher, and that that's what I've really think it is. I'm not I'm not a dollar bull by any stretch of the means as far as a you know from a macro uh standpoint but but I I believe that um that I I believe that the positioning is still so skewed uh that that the dollar could squeeze higher um for for you know just just on reasons alone of positioning and then you know maybe some risk aversion who knows. But anyway, um I, I guess I got a little off talk, topic there, uh, Dale, regarding uh, regarding the trend lines and the, and the length of time that they have to be established. But uh, it's great mentoring. That's not off topic. I mean, a lot of people out there uh, really don't. Even, you know, and that's simple. You would think everyone would know that that the longer the duration of a formation, the more significance it has. But you know, tr the trading public, a lot of people don't know that, Blake. So. You didn't well, get off track. You put you people know, on track when you well, talk about things like that. Awesome. Well, you know, you know, the the way I look at technical analysis is pretty simple. You know, the it's it's like a human. You know, the the older they are, the more respect I'm going to give them. The older in time, oh. the, that, that I got a lot of respect for you, Dale. I mean, tons. I mean, like tons. Oh. 
<laughs> Good metaphor. Yeah, I know because I know. <laughs> I, 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 you, you know, you know, I was setting my, I was setting you know, off. I mean, it in was, in Japan, it was, it's all, it all used to be very important to venerate the elderly. So I appreciate it. <laughs> Not that way in America, but uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um okay what, what what was i saying here um um gosh where, where was i going anyway so so the, there's the dollar index uh the dollar index um you know just you know it, it i i'm still bullish uh you know as i as i have a pattern in play on the dollar i i'm bullish um the dollar from a technical perspective i'm not necessarily bullish from a you know macro perspective but you know hey the charts are the charts so you know and you can see you yeah you can you can see the dollars you know still trying to grind its way higher we really got to punch through this you know 90 70 um you know before things get i crazy. i think 9150 blake and then 84 nostra pinker the ancient sage and by oh. the way you're you're catching up with me I, no, no, I'll I'll never catch up with you. <laughs> so let's. When I, stop. Uh, I have the uh, the Nasdaq. I just had an alarm go off. Oh, the Nasdaq's trying to pop through these highs. So we're we're actually taking out this downtrend line. Now we we've 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 been above here before uh, uh, earlier today. You can see we pushed right up into this uh, right into this you know previous support. Um, acting as current resistance you know adam button said uh on his interview this week that april the seasonals were pretty good for stocks and bearish for the dollar bearish canada which you know we've been on top of i don't know if you want to carry it but uh, uh i don't know if you want to cover it but it did rally back to the neckline before it failed yesterday yeah and, yeah yeah but you know, um, is is April you know good for stocks? Um, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I'm 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 not a big seasonals guy aside from you know uh, yeah. Christmas and and uh, you know the Christmas <laughs> holiday holidays. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, for, and then then you know in May it's usually you know the market kind of drifts off usually into the summer. So um, and you're you know, not a big fan of the season of summer in Arizona, are you? Oh my God! It's it's already ninety degrees here. It's hor horrible. Um, I know some of you are just just thawing out from snowstorms, but man, I'll tell you, it's it's tough. Um, so here's a Canadian. And matter of fact, uh, you know we are back at the neckline right now. So um, yeah. the neckline, you know, really resides at one twenty eight, and uh, the dollar cat is is pushing its way right back up there. Um, you know, will we? You know, will we? Gosh, this euro is trading so heavy. Yeah, and maybe I that mean, was a play. Uh, wait, uh, what go. if we had? Let me wow. ask you this: This would be a good lesson. Uh, what? What if we get? Wow. Oh, oh, no, I was just going to say that stops are getting triggered all over the place, Dale. Yeah, they are. Yeah, and you know, maybe this is a, a false breakdown of the head and shoulders. Sometimes failed formations are your best trades, aren't they? The, I'm sorry, failed formations? Yes. Yeah. Yes, they, yes, they can be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the euro is really starting to push here. Um, it's 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 trying to make a move. So yeah, you got to watch this euro dollar because, you know, we, we may, again, uh, this is one of those situations where we could end up flushing all these stops down here. And, and like the pound looks like it's going to flush the stops below 140.10. Uh, I mean, we're we're already we're already trying here. Um, let's see if we can do it again. I, I, you know, just as I was saying, oh, this stuff doesn't happen pre NFP, but you know, a lot, th this is one of those unexpected events where people go, oh, well, there's no way it's going to happen. So everybody gets long as we're approaching the support, and then you end up flushing all those stops through there. So Euro dollar is doing the exact same thing. Um, now look at the euro. This is gonna be this is gonna be a key. I'm gonna have an alarm go off here in a second too. I mean, if the pound pushes through 140, it's gonna trip a lot of stops here. Yeah, that could take us all the way down to you know, yeah, you know, maybe 130, 139. Eight, oh, here we go. Euros busting. Hold on. Wow, look at that. Trying. It's trying. 121. Have your oh, pounds going. Yeah. 
or euros going. It must be me. That is you. That 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 that's you. Uh, although uh, since you and I, share, we we all of us on the Forex Analytics uh, team, we we share uh, the charting packages through TradingView uh, on the same account with multiple users. We whenever I set up alarms, they go off on everybody, which is uh, unfortunate for poor like Amanda. Half the alarms are going off when she's asleep, uh, or when she's asleep in the UK, <laughs> or not paying attention. Uh, well, I mean, it happens for Steve and Stelios and 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 Andre as well, and and Grega. But <laughs> just man, those alarms go off, and it's always waking her because she's you know single mother. So anyway, um, okay, so we're watching the cable here. I mean, this is uh, again stops, stops, stops galore happening right now. Uh, I, I, I'm, I mean, looking at the cable, it looks like it's going to go further because we're one of the, one of the telltales when the market falls like this is you're not getting a bounce yet, which uh, suggests to me that there's some pretty significant selling going on. Uh, let's look at look at the euro. A euro really. Um, the, the euro starts to slice through. This is the 122.40. I mean, we're right here. We could really push some stops here too. Let's see, because if the euro breaks, then it's just going to drag the cable down too. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, like you said, market structure, uh, positioning. A lot of people that have been dollar bears are now getting flat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, the, well, that's that's the thing, Dale. Is you've got a lot of lot of dollar, um, you got a lot of dollar bears out there. A lot of people that have been very bullish the euro, and um, you know, they they they're probably a little nervous right now. I would venture to guess. Let's see, see if this uh, see if we're gonna get any follow through. I doubt we're gonna get any follow through, but you never know. You know, that's uh. Let's see here. Yeah, it's 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 a hard call. Pre non farm payroll, it's like, you know, do, do you really want to chase it short down here? Probably not. But at the same time, you know, if you got you have a bunch of nervous Nellies out there wanting to hit the bid and just get out, you know, that's that's where that's where the acceleration starts. Or if you miss it, prudence over valor. The low right. Another setup. Right. Well, hey, I, guys. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't expect the move to this move to start happening ahead of uh, ahead of the um, you know data coming out here in a minute. So I got to pass Go it ahead. over to Steven Stelios. Is Steve, are you guys here? Uh, we are here. Let me just say one thing before Steve takes over. Um, hello, everybody. By the way, um, Hi, there, there are a couple. Of, hi, there are a couple of people asking this if is, this is recorded and uh, or is it live or where can they see it? It is live, I and mean, you can watch the recording on our Forex Analytics YouTube channel, which is uh, well, if you go to YouTube and type in Forex Analytics, you'll get to our channel there. So you can see every past webinar and everything we've uh, we've done over there. Interview. Uh, we get we uh, yeah we get head videos. Etc. All of them are, are there in different categories. We post them like two to three hours um, after the event is done. You you should find them edited and uploaded there. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, hey, good morning. Good morning, you two. I got to get uh, for this uh, for this data. Um, so you guys have a great day. Uh, thank you, Dale, and um, uh, happy Thursday. We'll see you guys tomorrow for NFP. Good hunting. Thanks. Absolutely good hunting, Blake. Hi, uh, Steve. How are you? Hey Dale, I can complain. The weather is fantastic, and yeah. you know, a nice yeah, work getting some relaxation. Yeah, getting some relaxation is always <laughs> needed, right? Yeah, you know that's the or one at least one of the advantages of what we do is we're portable. So you know you, you're not locked through. into a location. You can do this anywhere. So you do yeah, it. Although, yeah, although I have to tell you that it's different, you know, being in front of my computer with multiple screens and on a MacBook, as you understand, you know, it gives me different 
ability yeah. to you know monitor things you know uh, more efficiently but yeah you can definitely do it for you know a few days so you can combine it with uh, a few days of vacation etc there's no question about it still you know, right, working, way, uh, we, you... we just got some data which was uh, yeah, that's what I pretty to bad say. across the board uh, worst initial job claims uh, worst trade balance worst revisions so let's see if that manages to dent the dollar at all uh, for, for the time being, I, I see that it hasn't done anything to the dollar. I mean, I still yeah. see the dollar getting uh, bid. Uh, if you remember, Dale, yesterday, I, I'm not going to talk about the pound a lot because I already had Blake that did. But if you remember, Dale, yesterday, my words were that I believe that cable is going to break down from there no, no matter what, right? Yeah, because of the pre three previous or four previous very weak candles. Yeah, exactly. So, you see, know, I remember everything you say. I know, I know, I know, I know. You, you, you have the memory of an elephant. Um, so uh, that's what we're seeing today. It's really no surprise. I mean, if you ju if you were just watching the candlesticks, it was more than obvious that um, you know the cable was in in a in a bearish consolidation. You want to call it a bull flag. You want to call it a pennant. It doesn't really matter if we go down to the four-hour chart. Uh, we can more clearly see. Uh, that it's it was more or less uh, some kind of a let's call it a flag. Um, so the cable is continuing lower, which means that we should see at least at least one more leg to the downside. Now, where that might extend to, uh, 139 level of interest in my opinion. Uh, you can even see it from the daily chart. So one 139 is a possible target. Um, and below that, below there, we can we can talk about it. I mean, you know, we, there are multiple uh, areas of support. Um, with with uh, the most important being uh, the possibility of coming down and retesting the broken uh, channel to the downside, um, you know, from from the upside. I mean, um, which uh, currently comes at 138 roughly. So 139 and 138, quite important uh, support areas. Um, I'm going to be closely monitoring because, in all honesty, I still don't think that there is any uh, real signal that the cable has, has actually found the top and we're about to push decisively to the downside. So, uh, bearish to the, in the short term, I even said it yesterday, uh, but definitely not bearish yet for the medium to long term. I do believe that there is a good chance that the cable will push higher from here once again at some point when this correction is, is done. And perhaps the next push to the upside is going to be terminal. But I don't see the signs that this this has already uh, been a top that we've uh, found. Like uh, when was it? At the beginning of the year at uh, 143.50. Okay. Uh, in the short term, though, I keep looking lower. Um, uh, I, I think that you know the short term signals uh, show that. Now, having to do with the Euro USD, I'm not going to go over it. Blake showed that ascending trend line. Um, I have to tell you though that from a personal opinion, I just want to add that. You know, we very often see trend lines like like the one that Blake showed, that you you are expecting that might produce some follow through once you you see them break, and then you take them and you see no follow through. In essence, uh, for me to trust that trend line or any trend line, um, you, I need to see uh, acceleration after we break below it. So, bottom line, if we break below that trend line and I see the market accelerating to the downside, then I'm going to know that. That trend line was not only important, you know, during uh, the past several months, but it is still important to the market because if the market simply stops responding to it, uh, you know, I, I will keep on monitoring horizontal levels of support and resistance. In which case, I have to say once again that for me, 121 is a very, very critical level. So in in this case, it has been. Um, a resistance multiple times. It was a resistance uh, at the high we found in September. We uh, stalled at the beginning of the year, uh, retesting that area as well. And you know, if 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 we see this uh, recent consolidation as a channeled consolidation, you will see that even the channel support passes from 121 at the moment. So, um, you know, personally, 121 is a key level for me, even more important than uh, the ascending trend line. But definitely the ascending trend line is one you should be monitoring, especially, as I said, because if you see some kind of an acceleration, it will mean that the market considers it important. 
And you know, that's all you need to care about, what the market thinks, not what, what you were thinking in advance. Now, having to do with the USD again, uh, as far as I heard, I, I heard most of the um, uh, webinar before. I don't think Blake um, had an overview of the USD yen. Unsurprisingly, the USD yen is breaking above this channel. If you remember, I said that, you know, it, it looks like it wants to move higher if stocks uh, stop being under pressure, this kind of a divergence that we've been seeing, meaning that stocks were actually um, uh, moving to the downside, but USD yen was uh, not pushing the new lows, uh, is, uh, is going to uh, produce at least one more push to the upside. And as you see, stocks did stabilize and we're seeing a break above this decent channel. I do think that there is a decent potential that the USD yen can extend even up to 109 uh, before uh, it, it resumes the move lower. So um, I, I think that the fact that we're breaking above this uh, channel uh, is definitely in the short term a bullish uh, development. The next resistance is roughly at 108. Why? Because that's the 38.2 of the last leg lower. Um, so it's, it's it's an important FIB level. And the next area of resistance, as we said, is the 109. Why? Because it's the confluence of the 50% FIB and the broken triangles support that might easily act resistance from this point on. I'm going to zoom out so you can actually see how important that trend line has been. Magnet. Okay, it's, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And as I said, it's, it also confluences with a 50% FIB, right? So why not? I mean, 109 can actually indeed act as, like, as, as a magnet. Um, okay, having to do with stocks, what I said yesterday, uh, although we were, if I remember uh, right on the lows of the days when we said that, I said that, listen, you never know. We might, you know, if you see a reversal and, you know, bulls managing to reclaim the 200 DMA and we managing to close for a second day above it, you know, things might change. Uh, but if we close once again below the 200 DMA, uh, were my words, I think that the bulls are going to give up in which case we should see S uh, S&P extending its losses and we should see the 2480, perhaps even the, the 2400 level uh, being tested within a few days. What happened, uh, as you saw yesterday, is that actually the bulls managed once again to reclaim the 200 DMA. Actually, the market yesterday closed almost at the highs, which was, you know, a very emphatic signal that, you know, they haven't given up. And, you know, as long as this, this area is holding, because it's a confluence, actually, of, of the um, channels, the broken channels support, which, you know, once again has shown that it's relevant, and the 200 DMA, once, as long as that level is holding, the uh, scenario that this might be a triangle, so this, this whole consolidation, this, this whole correction might be like a, a big consolidation, is staying alive and definitely this is a corrective scenario that has a uh, bullish interpretation right uh, because yeah, you know you know uh, Steve, uh, I, I know you're on vacation but I do listen to CNBC sometimes I actually do turn the volume up and uh, the sense I got like on fast money and some of their shows is uh, the bulls are uh, declaring victory that the correction is over it makes me a little skeptical although I could see the bull case that, uh, you know, yesterday they're saying that's it, um, you know, they're bullish again, the correction's over, and it seemed pretty unanimous. That's all I'm saying. And, you know, when everyone's okay, saying I didn't, I didn't one actually thing, know that. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, I, these days I haven't been, yeah, I haven't been monitoring, uh, uh, you know, Twitter and, um, you know, channels or whatever, so I'm just p paying attention, you know, at lucky price action. For, yeah, lucky for you. Yeah. A few times per day, I'm just, you know, watching the markets and uh, looking at price action. So I, I, I stay within the feeling of the market. But if you remember, Dale, uh, first of all, one thing I've, I've said literally hundreds of times in this webinar in the one year we've been on is that you can never know in advance the structure of the corrective move until uh, a new impulsive wave begins. Right. Yes. And we haven't seen that yet. We haven't seen that yet. So this can be even more complex correction. I mean, we can go back, retest these trans resistance, fail from there, then push to new lows, 
or whatever else, but the simplest interpretation so far remains one of a triangle having to do with the SPX, which, which is also co considered globally the risk barometer. Um, so, you know, this, this remains an active scenario, there's no, no question about it. Uh, and if you remember, we had said, I had said when we were here, down at that double bottom, when we found the double bottom, I said one thing and one thing only with absolute conviction, conviction that this market has no chance of pushing to new highs within a few days. No matter what happens, no matter what kind of a structure we're going to get, it's going to take at least several weeks for the market to be able to push to new highs, even if it remains bullish and, you know, on, on its way to, uh, to all-time highs, right? And we've seen that so far. So, yeah, so far, we've respected I'm the fact witness. that... You yeah, did say so that we, would, we could consolidate for a long time. Uh, that would be the most uh, optimistic scenario, is that we just yeah, go sideways in wild ranges. Yeah. 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 Good call. Yeah. But in all honesty, I do believe, and I still believe, that volatility is here to stay. So I do believe that even if we eventually, even if that's soon, like in 10 days from now, we do see a push to new highs, which I think it's going to take more than that, even if that's the case, um, I do believe that we're not going to get back to that sick environment that stocks were slowly melting up every single day with volatility being subdued at the eight handles and the nine, nine handles, etc. I think we're entering probably the, the very last phases of a bull market. So even all time highs, I think, um, uh, might come with uh, much more elevated um, volatility than we've gotten used to during the past few years. And I think that's going to be a very, very um, telling sign of what I'm saying, that the, this will be the last uh, legs of, of, of a bull market, actually, that I don't think we'll have uh, much fuel to run from, uh, from that know, point Steve, on. Right. If you go to the NASDAQ 100, I would love to see new highs. Okay, I'd be oh, all over yeah, it. I see it why. would be a third drive. You know why. Yeah, I see why. I see why. Absolutely. I absolutely see why. Yeah. I, 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 totally, I totally understand why. Yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely. And I think a lot of people would get trapped there. Um, retail investors that got burned by trying to uh, ride this bull market at, at, the, at its very last legs in January um, might also be entering back in the market um, once that happens. So, yeah, everybody's going to be jumping on the bandwagon once again. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. And, you know, the, the market the market tends to be uh, very tricky and, you know, tends to trap the, you know, the I mean, it, 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 it has the tendency of inflicting the maximum amount of pain to the maximum number of participants, right? So, yeah, that would be a scenario that, you know, uh, would definitely bode well with what we've gotten used to seeing. Um, so yeah, give me a rally in April into the sell in May and go away with the NASDAQ at 73 to 7400. Would love to see it. Yeah, 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 why not? Absolutely. But one thing is for sure in the short term, as long as we're seeing these keywords in stocks holding, especially since we got an attempt to falsely break down, uh, you know, we, we should be very, very careful because. I said it yesterday, we close once again below the 200 EMA, I think the bulls are going to give up. But they managed to reclaim it and we close high. And especially yesterday, we closed at the highs of the day after having printed an outside white candle, an outside bullish candle in essence. You should be careful if, you, if you're short risk. You should be careful. USD yen is also breaking out. Some of the yen pairs are also finally um, showing that, that they're going to show some, uh, they're going to have some polo truths, for example, Yesterday, when we looked at the market, the Aussie yen was getting rejected from the channel's resistance, but it closed on the highs of the day, testing the channel. Um, it's currently testing above. It's currently trading above it. We're seeing the we're seeing the USD yen uh, showing the follow through. Now let's have a look at the Aussie USD and the Kiwi, so we can also see that uh, you know. We, the technical damage has not happened yet here. So the Aussie is still holding the 76.40 level. The Kiwi, on the other hand, uh, is definitely holding uh, the 71.80 level. It's actually uh, pushing towards the highs. It has already broken above this 
descending trend line, and that says a lot. We we saw this, if I remember right, yesterday, this intermittent descending trend line, and I said that, listen, this is the first indication that the queue might want to break to the upside. Of course, you can view this as a range, with the range stop being the 74, um, 36 area, which, of course, is valid, but we also had a descending trend line, so it's a first indication that the Kiwi might want to resume to the upside and, you know, uh, and monitoring it. I don't have a position yet here, but I'm very happy that I see it break, breaking the upside because if you remember, I have exposure in three things at the moment and I'm, I'm lucky enough that everything is working fine. One of them is short palladium, which is still pushing lower. The other one, and then I now, since yesterday, have a full position is short Euro Kiwi and I'm looking forward for uh, for it to come down to the 166.70 area. So the stronger the Kiwi is, the better uh, the Euro uh, Kiwi short is going to perform. Um, by the way, if you see 166.70 break to the downside, I, I have to say that, uh, you know, this is going to be a very, very, very development because below 166.70, there is, you know, a huge pocket of, of, of air. I mean, I don't see any serious resistance, horizontally speaking at least, until the 166.60 area. So, you know, we're talking about uh, 500 pips of, of more downside potentially, right? So be very careful with that uh, if you're trying to catch a, a bottom here, uh, a corrective bottom. Um, so I do think that, you know, Aussie Kiwi, uh, uh, sorry, Aussie Yen, Kiwi Yen, Kat Yen can still uh, have, uh, you know, uh, still have the potential of, of, of producing a big rebound. Yesterday it showed like uh, this might be failing, but I said, you know, we need to give it a little bit of a time. Uh, but as it hey, seems, Brian, you know, it, 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 they're doing it. Yeah, I'd like just to point so, out yeah. that, you know, if you're at our face webinars, which are free, uh, we were on top of the Euro Kiwi breakdown live during the webinar, and you were adding to positions yes. on that. And so I, I forget if it was Monday or Tuesday, I think Tuesday. And uh, so, I mean, we were right there on top of it while it was happening, which is pretty cool for a free FX webinar, don't you think? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking of the Kiwi Yen, what's the 78.30 area? It's a horizontal area of interest. I think that from this point on, even if you see some weakness, I would be monitoring the 67.50 to 77.70 area as, as a possible area of support. Um, I do think that uh, an, an important target for this rebound could be the 79.30 area. So. Uh, I do believe that, you know, this rebound can easily um, produce another 120, 30 pips from here, but obviously I wouldn't advocate somebody buying it, um, you know, at this point. As I said, any pullbacks towards the 77.50 area, even towards 70.70 area, bottom line, as long as we remain above 77 in the Kiwi Yen, I think that attempts to see another uh, leg higher in this potentially corrective move uh, I think they're worth it, okay? So um, we're currently at 78, 17. I think as long as 77 holds um, attempts to be buying for another push towards the 79, 30 area uh, look quite good. Kiwi, Kiwi Yen in, in general uh, technically uh, shows, um, uh, you know, uh, very well behaved. Let's go to the weekly chart so you can have a look. There it is. Okay. So let me zoom out. Steve, you still have um, like a 10 second lag because you're remotely accessing your computer. So just factor I'm not in. remotely accessing my computer. Ah, you're not. Okay. Ah, you're on the. No, it's just, you know. The, okay. Uh, no, I'm on the MacBook. Yeah. You're on the MacBook. Okay. Well, we're now okay. we're getting, now we're seeing you change the chart. So one second. Okay, okay, that doesn't really matter. I'm going to stick to the daily charts for now, so we don't have too much switching. So um, I think that was a, you know, that was a broad overview of what I wanted to say. Stelio, I'm pretty sure we have uh, plenty yes. of questions. So why yes. don't you go ahead and give me some so we can cover there, them? There's one, there's one which I'm going to answer first, and then I'm going to hand it over to you. Absolutely. Um, our friend Karem is asking about the LIBOR OS spread. 
um, and he's saying, can the LIBOR OS spread actually indicate the shortage of foreign dollars and turn this massively since everybody's positioned bearish the dollar? Um, now, LIBOR OS spreads, for those who don't know, I used to I used to market make those in the crisis 10 years ago. And there, it's a spread between uh, OIS, which is a factor of what's priced into the Fed funds rate for the future, very simple. What's priced into the Fed doing for the next you know, year, two, three years, whatever. A LIBOR, on the other hand, is, is where banks lend to each other money. So this spread used to be historically very low, between 5 and 10 basis points. And, and the spread, when it widens, it shows um, periods of distress in the markets. Um, so from 5 to 10 basis points in the, during the crisis in 08, 09, it went to 150, I think, if I remember, which was insane. And if I um, remember, Stelio, you were actually trading it to the long side, right? I was always tra trading to the long side. I didn't capture all the upside, but I, I, did, I did well. Um, and um, there are two reasons why this spread is going to widen. The OIS part is very is very straightforward. It just tracks what the market's pricing in for the Fed. So that's it's very straightforward. The LIBOR part, though, can can go out can widen because either um, banks don't want to lend to each other because they're they're afraid of credit conditions, you know, of, of uh, defaults like they were in 08. Um, uh, this is not happening now. Or now that the the spread is up to sixty, if I remember, which is is very high compared to the to the norm. Historically, um, it's very high. Yes, yes. Um, they can also not want to lend because, as Karem correctly says, um, there's a shortage of dollars, and you know they they're reluctant to to, to lend out dollars um, at uh, I don't know at low levels. So yes, Karem, the, I I personally think this is the reason why this spread is blowing out. Um, there is reluctance to 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 sell to to lend dollars, not because of uh, credit uh, fears like in the crisis, but because um, you know there is a shortage, and that, as you correctly say, might push the the, the dollar higher. And I've I've said this in the past webinars. I personally think the dollar's got one leg higher, just like Dale said. Actually, I think the Dixie goes to 92, and then it just and then it goes down. So. Um, just to answer that question very quickly, obviously it's it's a, it's a complicated thing. This uh, the LIBOR I spread, but just just as an overview. Um, what a great so, what a great explanation, uh, Stel. Really good. Yeah. So Wimpy's out of luck because I was going to ask you. Uh, I, I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, by, by the way, by, by the way, uh, uh, Dale, as you've said many times, you know, you see that contributors here are actually people that were in the markets, right? Stelios was trading billions, literally billions of dollars back then for the bank, and you know, you don't randomly get people doing that, right? I, I've seen yeah. a series on HBO, billions. Oh, that's not <laughs> Stelios in there. <laughs> I mean, you know, really, Steve. Uh, uh, I was that's why I was excited to join you the team a year ago is because you know I had uh, I followed all you guys so uh, yeah I think the combination is pretty powerful of the team that you guys put together. So, we are very happy to have all of us here, every single person. That's pretty, that's pretty um, true. Right, Steve. We are asked uh, some Sterling crosses, uh, Guppy, Sterling, Aussie, Sterling, Kiwi. Absolutely. You, you covered some of the yen crosses. So let's By the way, I promised I, I promised yesterday to I promised yesterday to remind people on time. Uh, there's a new tablet application. We we had the phone application, which yes, you could install on a tablet if you really wanted. But you know, we 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 actually built a tablet application free, of course. You just have to sign in if you're a client with your credentials, uh, both for iOS and um, Android devices. So go ahead and you can go to the uh, Google Play Store or or the um, uh, uh, Apple uh, Store, and you know you can download it for free. I, I, we we've used a new design that we're going to bring on the browser version as well within a month from now. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. It's extremely efficient. Uh, you have everything in single screen. Uh, so please, if you haven't noticed, um, go ahead and do so now. Um, okay, Stelio, uh, you said the Guppy. What else? Uh, Guppy, Sterling Aussie, and Sterling Kiwi. We've been asked. Absolutely. Let's have a look at them. Just, just remember about the lag as well, and uh, we we'll take it from there. Yeah, yeah. I, I just switched. Okay. Um, you know, Guppy is still finding uh, the 50% fee, but 150, 80. 
quite hard to uh, crack to the uh, upside. Uh, yesterday, I thought there is a good chance we would be breaking to the downside from this ascending channel. We didn't do so, but my thesis hasn't changed. My outlook hasn't changed, meaning I still believe that this overlapping slow choppy move higher has, uh, you know, a limited potential. I mean, can we push higher from here? Sure, we can even push towards the 152.20 area, which is the 61.8. Uh, but do I believe that we can push to new highs from here? The question is, the answer is no. I believe that, um, you know, even if the gap is to resume at some point, you know, a bullish trend and push to new highs, I do believe that it has to first satisfy at least, um, you know, pro producing one more leg to the downside. And, you know, the rebound we've seen uh, points me to the same direction as well. Well, so I am looking for this move to fail at some point sooner rather than later. Okay, so I wouldn't be looking for opportunities to be buying the gap here. I would either remain sidelined or I would be looking for opportunities to sell it. Okay, uh, that, that's that's my outlook and it hasn't changed having to do with uh, the gapping. Now, let me go to the pound dose. And I have to tell you that the pound dollar is definitely looking much better, for example, than the euro kiwi. Nothing has changed since yesterday. This looks to me more or less like a pennant, at least for now, right? So let me mark it here for you. This looks to me for now like a pennant, like this. I know that you know there's a little bit of a delay, but you should see it in a few seconds. Um, so. You know, this is what I'm monitoring, uh, a, a break to the upside at some point. It might end up being a bull flag, right? If it's a bull flag, it might push lower from here first. Uh, but definitely, I'm not seeing any serious signs that the pound dose is, you know, collapsing. It's it's breaking the downside. It's, it's impulsive in any way. So uh, I remain bullish in, in the medium term. Obviously, I wouldn't be buying it yet, right? The pound kiwi looks way more bearish, and we know why, because the kiwi is a lot more bullish than the Aussie is. Uh, so obviously, if you want to be buying one of them, you should be looking for the pound dollars. If you want to be selling one of them, you should be looking for the pound kiwi. There's no question about it. Key level uh, for the pound kiwi remains the 190.50. Okay, so 190.50, quite a key level. Um, I do think that, you know, we don't have a sign that this has found the bottom yet. We also have this ascending uh, trend line support. I showed it yesterday. Uh, we are also currently testing the 50 DMA. I think that, um, uh, you know, this, this, this corrective move lower uh, is not done uh, yet. So uh, if you're looking to be buying, I would definitely seek more confirmation. Okay. Sergio, what else do we have? Uh, okay, we have time for one last one. Let me just find it. Uh, there was a friend who's asking but, about the Nifty. Sorry. Oh yeah, absolutely. He was saying, he was saying if, there's a, if there's a um, correlation with the S&P, you know, the Nifty is broken 200 DMA, but then it bounced back. So if you want to have a look at that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the last time we had a look at the Nifty, I said that, listen, Ideally, I would want the Nifty to push down to the 9,700 area, but it had already satisfied uh, my uh, my need, I mean, by seeing it from a technical standpoint, of producing one more low. It came back, it retested that broken pennant, and then it pushed once again to a new low. So I had said the last time we looked at it that, listen, I, I can't exclude that we found a trade low in the Nifty, right? Ideally, I would want it to be a little bit lower, but I can't exclude it. So I have to tell you that, yeah, sure. I mean, it might push higher from here, but for me to believe that the Nifty, you know, has definitely turned back to bullish mode, I would need to see a break above 10,600. As long as it remains below that, it's somewhat vulnerable. And the, the structure is not... It's not conclusive yet, right? I mean, it, it's okay. It's it's not the same thing sometimes that, you know, I can't have high conviction where it is at the moment because even if it produces a new law from here, it, it's not going to be out of the question. I mean, it's not going to look like something that's unexpected. But on the other hand, 
if it has already found a low, it's still not going to be a surprise. So I would definitely be more patient with the Nifty. Um, and I, I would be very keen in seeing how uh, pullbacks um, are going to behave. So what, what kind of a bidding we're going to have after any pullback. So are we going to be seeing uh, moves to the upside looking more impulsive than actually moves to the downside? That, that's, that's going to be a key factor in determining if we already, already found a low or not. Okay. I, I, just said, see one, I, you... I, just, I just see one technical thing that tells me there is a chance for new highs. Can you guess what it is? Uh, the RSI? It, 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 yeah, it peaked. Uh, uh, it was a confirmed high. Momentum and price. I agree, I agree with you. And, and that's yeah. why also in all the indices, and we've said it many times, and if you remember, Dale, I said since the very beginning, I made it abundantly clear, even from the first days that the S&P was selling off, that you should make sure that you persuade yourself to be watching these sell-offs as corrective because these are well-established uptrends and I know that you know human nature human psychology is to be looking for like nice big reversals because they, they yield like magnificent rewards but you should be respecting the, the larger trend and the larger trend remains the upside so any move that starts no matter how brutal it initially might look still has a very high potential of being a corrective one right same yes. applies to the new I, well you know there are there are exceptions but most markets don't peak that. when momentum and price is confirming and most markets don't bottom when momentum and price is confirming you're there absolutely are right. exceptions. yeah you're absolutely right and and the game we're playing game in quotes of course is in essence a game of statistics right Trying to be always, always, always right is going to kill you because it's impossible. Uh, you need to, you know, follow your rules so you are more times right than wrong, and that's all you need. That plus uh, risk management, nothing else. And money. In fact, okay. what good? Uh, is, I, uh, and, in, <laughs> and in fact, what yeah. good is happiness? It can't buy you money. So uh, thank you, thank you very much, Steve and Stell. You're a great moderator too, and very great, uh, excellent explanation of LIBOR. So we have Chris Carolyn with us. Uh, I'm I'm real excited to talk to Chris. I've admired his work for a long time, and when I say a long time, you guys know how old I am. Blake brought it up today. So, uh, Chris, welcome back for your return visit to Face and. I'm passing you the ball, buddy, like the NBA playoffs, and look forward to hearing your voice and seeing what you have to show us today. Oh, and he brought Bitcoin. Hi, Chris. Let me check your mic. See if you're... Dale, he's unmuted uh, from our side, and he's unmuted yeah. from his side as well he must check uh, he, he should check if he has uh, collect, uh, um, selected the right the proper uh, microphone and yeah uh, you know just waiting for you to make the adjustment so we can hear you Chris yeah there is there, there, is, there is an expandable uh, part of the, uh, the panel uh, yeah uh, which is called audio under that you can select uh, whichever microphone uh, or output source you wish from the available ones on your computer. So make sure you've selected the proper ones there. Oh, it says it's, he's offline. Do I see right? Yeah, I see him offline now. Maybe it's going to come back. We'll wait a yeah, perhaps he's, he's, he's trying to relog, perhaps. I'm, I'm guessing, yeah. yes. Worth the wait, guys. Guy was uh, made and was very famous during his years with Robert Prechter. Now look at look at these highs on new moons in Bitcoin. Yeah, be, be, uh, crypto cryptos. I have to say that you know have not been trading. <laughs> the someone, the investors. Someone said that Bitcoin today traded at six 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 six. 
Uh, remember the low in uh, 08 in the S&P? 667, if I remember right. It was... 666. Uh, Three six. I, I, I thought it was 667, actually. No, okay. no, check it out. It's a sign of the devil, man. <laughs> devil inside. The devil inside. Everybody's got the devil inside. But, but Remember in, that in all honesty, they... In all honesty, Dale, we still we still don't have technically any signal that they're rebounding. I mean, they uh, both um, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, the other one that has become very popular, the Ripple one. Uh, you know, they they they're trading you know very heavily. I mean, uh, I I really don't uh, know um, uh, what we're going to see. High was, look at what someone. Oh, you can't see, but one of our attendees is saying the crude high was 66.60. Now, why do these things happen? I have no idea. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person that's going to answer to you coincidence. Yeah, I know. So Chris is still offline. Let's see if he's trying to reach me on Twitter. OK, uh, check it out. Yeah. I'm online. Um, I the screen. Uh, Dale, if you want to pass me the screen so we can see a few more things until he's he's back, I have absolutely no problem. We can we have more things to to see and show actually. Okay. And you know if if Chris is back, you know even better. You got it. Yep, I confirm that I got it. Okay, so um, by the way, I am <laughs> I am two dollars from hitting the the palladium target. Okay, that was fast. Nine twelve. Okay, that's nice. Um, okay, so Estelio, give me more questions, mate. Um, hold on a second. Right. Uh, our friend Michael is asking about copper. He went to two. I know we saw it yesterday. Copper, I don't sure. know. Have a look at he said he went to two ninety seven and now bounced. He seems to be moving on news. What the technical show? Uh, the technical show. We, we we've said it before that uh, two ninety five, two ninety two to two ninety five. I said, uh, you know, a very very key area of support. As long as we stay above there. There is still the potential that this is a consolidation because you know the the price action has been slow, has been choppy um, uh, to the downside. Uh, so, in my opinion, the bull bear line is there, 292, 295. Meaning, above there, okay. I remain bullish. Okay, so, as long as we hold this, I'm going sure. to try and get Chris online. Chris is back. Let's see if we could get it to work, Steve. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's a key area, 292, 295. Thank you, Steve. Okay, Chris, let's try it again. Let's see. We were able to show your screen last time. We just didn't have any audio from you. How about now? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, good, Chris. Thank you very yeah, much. We, uh, can you see my screen? Got the Bitcoin charts up there, Chris. Uh, thank yep. you for thank Excellent. you for coming back. Okay. So, yeah. Sorry about. I don't know what technically happened there, um, but that's we're okay. Good now. That's okay. You know, uh, anyone uh, anyone could have an issue with it. Uh, what's important is that you uh, many times over the years have known what's going on in different markets. Uh, uh, I you know I first started hearing and following you back in your Prector days. So how long ago was that? Uh, well, I'm, I met Prechter, uh, Bob Prechter, uh, two days before the October mini crash in 1989. And okay. I told him that the market was about to drop 10% in a few days. And mm -hmm. um, that happened two days after that. And that began our relationship. And uh, so that's a, a while ago. Yeah, so that, yeah. That, that is a while ago, so that shows uh, how old you and I are, Chris. Uh, yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, you brought some Bitcoin charts, and 
Uh, and for people that don't know what your work is based on, uh, your Twitter handles at Spiral Cal for Spiral Calendar, which is basically um, some type of lunar calendar. Am I correct, Chris? Uh, well, it's it's yes. Um, um, my original observation, I, you know, I was an option trader in in the pits um, in San Francisco in the 1980s. I mean, I started as a runner, as a 20-something kid, and became a floor broker and then a market maker. And, Sounds familiar. Yeah. Well, it's a path many of us took, and yeah. uh, um, and it, it's so valuable, you know. To and, and I, I used to joke that they shouldn't give economics uh, PhDs out unless people fulfill a requirement to stand in a pit with their with their net lick at at risk of a one percent standard deviation mood, and and that would that would solve a lot of this. Uh, uh, efficient market nonsense. So, um, but I've been very tuned in and, and experiencing the crash of, of 1987, where markets topped on new moons, the, and, and 1929 also, and exploring that relationship between 29 and 87 and those crashes. And, and that was the, the seed of my research into irrational market behavior and panics and crashes and manias. And, uh, you know, this. This Bitcoin chart, uh, uh, I I looked through the charts that I showed the last time we talked, Dale, and I don't know, that was September, October, and uh, I showed this chart um, in our last interview um, about how Bitcoin had a tendency for these blow-offs to uh, peak on new moons. And, um, you know, subsequently, here's, here's what happened in December. Right. Um, when Bitcoin, the the that the high of highs, that just complete crazy mania we witnessed, and uh, the top tick was I think about 17 hours uh, ahead of the of the new moon, which was early in the morning of the 18th of December. So, um, but but the spiral calendar is is something more than just just the lunar phases, and uh, here's here's really the, the the quick and dirty of it. Um, nice. which is ultimately what Bitcoin did, it, which was to, f to form what I call a, a perfect spiral, that f tremendous parabolic move um, into that new moon high. Now, these distances, these numbers, they represent, we're measuring time in uh, lunar months. Uh, and, okay. uh, and in lunar months, these distances from the lows all to this full moon are square roots of Fibonacci numbers. I mean, here's the actual Fibonacci sequence, and this right. is the actual uh, distances from these lows, each one, and it, just the entire, the only one that missed was was the, uh, the eight, um, you know, and that should have been right about here, and we accelerated off of that. But when yeah, I wrote the yeah, book 25 years it, ago, it's, it's kind of like whatever you believe in or don't believe that uh, this universe uh, was created by a mathematician or it was definitely a mathematician that uh, everything really has this rhythm. And well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I mean, math is 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 what we're made of. I mean, I, I and this is in the book um, at the end. I really think that. You know, it's we are the children of of Father Time and and Mother Gravity, as it were, and and so what this is, it's it's the interplay of time and gravity, uh, and but Bitcoin is extraordinary because it formed this perfect pattern, and it, it I when I wrote the book, I never thought we'd see something like this. There's too much noise in data. There's too much other influences on prices, interest rates, and fundamentals, and whatever. But when Bitcoin came along, it was just pure emotion, um, and that allowed it to form this extraordinary mania that we saw unfold in the fourth quarter last year. And I think it also was a, a – it, this occurred because a, there was no friction in the market. And um, I don't know if you follow – Oh, yeah, you Bitcoin couldn't short really short it. You really couldn't short it until right. you couldn't right? short it, but also the this tether business. I don't know how much you know about these tethers, which were I, literally I played printed out of thin air. Yeah, and, tether ball in junior high. I played Chris, 
and 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 these tethers that were linked to the dollar in a sense were printed and they they produced a, a frictionless situation that allowed it to you know it, it, it's like blowing hot air onto a flame and you create a furnace and you get higher temperatures so um there was no chance for for the for the parabola to break early it was just it had so much fuel to it but what was fascinating is once the spiral was complete they kept printing tethers they printed them in january like they were going out of style but it no longer mattered because the psychology of the market had had flipped the the irrational uh, mania had ended okay can i ask you something uh did gan because you know Gann, and I, I know that you're you you probably studied some of W. D. Gann because of your time work. Did he use lunar lunar calendars because he believed time was more important than price? Uh, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, okay. I I followed Gann. I went down that path for a ways, and then I said, I'm I'm making my own path. So okay, uh, cool. Uh, you're a maverick, man. A little bit sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> So that's a beautiful example of, yeah, you know, perfect. Uh, maybe it's more like tulip mania than any of the other market events that we saw. Or do you just see uh, this being uh, a parallel to like 29 inequities? And oh, I, th I think this, I mean, this was unusual because this market was able to penetrate much further. You know, uh, okay. people all around the world can trade Bitcoin. There are exchanges in, you know, hundreds and hundreds of exchanges. There are no minimum requirements. Uh, there, there are people trading, you know, two dollar accounts and 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 trying to scalp a penny. Um, so it, it it really has a tremendously large input of of data. You know, I just think the whole Bitcoin time series has been a has been an extraordinary piece of data to study for uh, fear and greed behavior. And, and I mean, I, I just want to point out, you know, that there are there are nine points of reference here, nine lows that all relate to this one foot, what I call the focus point of the full moon. So, you know, these 10 points, there's just no way that this is a random accidental um, occurrence. And and most importantly, the fact is it, it fits the structure that was outlined in the book that I wrote 25 years before this this happened. So the, this spiral was a, a tremendous affirmation of the work I did years and years ago. You know, I thought. Full moon was, lows. Okay, so full moon lows and new moon highs is what. Well, well, that's is what you look at. Yeah, generally the the full moon and the winter solstice are. Are negative influences. Summer solstice, new moons are positive, but it's the timing relationships and these these spiral constructs that that start affecting things. And um, uh, yeah, so that's okay. that's kind of a short thing. But I, I also want to talk today about some other aspects of irrational market behavior and and some other inputs and. Um, so this is kind of interesting. The the blue is the S and P 500, and uh, this dotted line is just raw title data from uh, Battery Park in in New York for for 2018, and um, it's it's pretty extraordinary. And I'm this title works. You know, a fellow named Robert Taylor wrote a, a novel called Paradigm, and uh, in the appendix he has. So it's interesting approach to markets with using title data, and and so I, um, that's the basis of 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 what you're seeing here, and then I've you know, kind of gone on from there. But um, we're in this period. Both you know, Bitcoin is one example. The S and P is another example of just very very irrational behavior, and and this type of analysis is very effective when everybody's irrational. But then there'll be you know, months and months or like 2017 when this type of work doesn't doesn't uh, sink up at all and markets are not irrational and people are, are just all kind of, you know, calm and collected. Interesting. Okay, so it's portending 
some type of rally uh, high into the 11 sometime or at least at least you know uh, strength i mean it okay. uh, you know and then it, it doesn't it, tell you magnitude it just no exactly yeah there's there's no comment here but now i've taken this a bit further in the next chart so uh, starting with the top clip here this the started line is that same title data we just looked at now the blue this is my salooner model and we all see seasonal charts where they take say the last 20 years of data average it and say this is the seasonal chart for the dow say when it'll be weak in october it'll be strong in january or whatever but my salooner model is it's a seasonal model it's the same seasonal data but it's only constructed from years that have the same lunar phases as this year so um if wow. if the full moon is on the, the 30th of march then the only uh inputs into the seasonal model are years where the full moon is close to the 30th of march so we can see on the top we can see those years the, and the tides will be similar in those years but not the same because there's there's many inputs but the circles really show us the periods where where the tides and in past years seem to have been effective so and, and those were translated here to the arrows and now the so this line is a sum of these two values it's a weighted sum of both the salerno model and the tides uh, so that gives me i call this sort of my combo and then here's this year's of uh, Dow plotted against that and um, yeah so this is that rally up into around the 11th that relative strength not looking at extent but just just ex right. but we can see it's it's really been it's captured that rhythm very very well but again I want to make the point this works during irrational periods and then when things calm down this will go completely out of sync and have zero value um, but it is just fascinating. And it really, though, points to the idea that that it is these lunar and timing influences are um, the cause, if you will, of the irrationality. Um, someone on any, Twitter. Yeah, uh, I, was, yeah, it, I was just thinking, Chris, uh, if you see any similarities between one, as I look at your different models for a peak, I believe, you know, around you know the 11th of April, I believe the top in the in the market was around the 11th in February. Is that true? Uh, so is there a parallel in 87 when we peaked in uh, August and had the crash two months later in October that we're peak, we peaked in February and we could have uh, April could be the kickoff of a massive decline? Well, I, 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 I don't think so. The, okay. The interesting thing, uh, this year's Salooner model, if you plot out the whole year, um, this year is, is it actually, it, it stays pretty positive for, for most of the year. I mean, I, I think we're, we're maybe near the end of this, this, this sort of turbulent period. Um, okay. But, uh, you know, that's dicey. Uh, you know, this stuff is just inputs. And then ultimately, you know, you, you still got to watch. Go back your and, charts. You still have to go back to price, don't you? Always, so, always, always, because yeah. that's that's where the accounting happens. And, that's right. So and, I mean, all your intricate work are giving you um, ideas of what's happening under the surface, projecting into the future. But when it comes down to it, you're you know you still need price confirmation to take trades off this. Ex exactly, and otherwise. Um, uh, you don't last very long in this business, as you know. And yeah. uh, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, it was a great parabola in in uh, Bitcoin, Chris. I know you. Pr you pr oh, you want to show some other things? Well, but, yeah. Well, well, but yeah, I, we can... I was just I was just curious. You know, in this business, you're you know, what have you done for me lately? So we came off this parabola, and we've been you know uh, down pretty significantly. I don't know what 50, 60 percent. Um, is this uh, when par parabolic moves in? Uh, could this be over for quite some time before? Oh, I, I think it is over for quite some time, but it's it's very interesting. I you know, and and watching the tape day by day, uh, and and 
and the sentiment around these cryptocurrencies, I mean, I, I think without the tether business, it probably would have fallen further and faster than it has. And but when you watch the tape, um, the buyers in Bitcoin, you know, they don't look like they're trying to accumulate price. They're not trying to accumulate Bitcoin. They're trying to prevent it from falling. I mean, you okay. know, there's a, there's a a, a very uh, big like the uh, BOJ, like the BOJ and the Nikkei. Oh, exactly. There is a large vested interest in keeping this alive and and making it work. And um, but against that, you know, this is it's just been distributing, distributing, distributing. And um, you know, I'm watching it trying to find a low, but I don't think it has yet. Okay. Thank you for going back to that, Chris. So we could go to your next slide you wanted to show. Yeah, um, you know, something else interesting I've been tracking and I show these charts on Twitter uh, is is gold versus the various correlations. And, you know, gold and dollar yen has correlated very highly over the years. Uh, gold inverted correlated to tips. And then some of these uh, correlations have broken down in recent months. Um, and what's interesting is is that the uh, uh, gold is now correlating much tighter with the Chinese yuan than it than it ever has. And uh, you know, here's going back a couple of years. You know, there used to be no relationship between uh, gold and the yuan, and now they're they're becoming very tight. And in fact, I think um, uh, another fellow on Twitter, David Brady, made the the point. I think he's correct that that the Chinese are, are actively pegging their currency now to gold, um, which is which is a pretty interesting idea, and that may put pressure um, in coming months uh, on the ability of Western central banks to to keep the price of gold, uh, uh, you know, to, to to keep a lid on it. Although shorter term, I I listened to some of the commentary earlier here on on your webinar, and I agree. You know, the, the dollar is poised for a rally, and that's that's negative for the metals in 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 yeah, the near term. Yeah, that's certainly pretty close correlation right now. So the yuan and the dollar. Yeah, I'm thinking one more wash. You know, silver maybe to, you know, fifteen fifty, gold uh, thirteen. Uh, 1280, 1250 in there, and I like this chart because it's a trade I'm stalking and have been waiting for things to get cheaper. Also, I've noticed, Chris, that the silver shares, despite the weakness in the bullion, they're even holding up better than the gold shares. Are, are you seeing anything there on maybe the gold-silver ratio? I don't edited. really. I don't. I don't look at that. Uh, so that's okay. not something I. I look at. But uh, you know, I mean, I. I'm in agreement that just longer, longer term. Yeah, I mean, silver. Silver is probably the much better place to be, just in, in the historical. Uh, okay. Uh, how that ratio. And, and you. You look at. Uh, you know, I was schooled that uh, uh, in a bull market, the shares. Uh, shares always lead the underlying commodity and it's been the other way around gold's been strong and miners have been weak uh, any comment on on that well you know it, it, that may be the, the ETFs might might be a reason you know because it used to be if you wanted to play gold and you didn't have a futures account you you traded the miners and now wow. you people those people trade the ETFs great point you know I never thought of that that it's so obvious but great point so um, I'm, I tell you what, Chris, after this interview, I'm going to be watching the yuan uh, because, it, you know, I was watching the yen and that, you know, correlations are great till they stop working. And and then you you don't know for a while and it could be costly because you're counting on that correlation and all of a sudden there's a disconnect and you're going, wow, you know, I mean, this is telling me it should be doing that, but it's not anymore. So, yep, exactly. You know, uh, was there anything else you wanted to? I, well, I, I think I've got one more here. Yeah. Well, this is just you know I have do candle charts where um, I have really a set of four different types of signals that and and then I mark them here with arrows and uh, then I look for turns where they cluster close together. So you know these are sort of these little uh, these mark RSI divergences. The 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 uh, little crosses. Oh, and, okay. Um, 
So, you know, we're getting some, it's, it's trying to bottom here. This is just an oscillator I call the cycle trap. It's a, it's a proprietary oscillator. It's, it's pretty good, but it's still just an oscillator. So, you know, Bitcoin's trying to bottom, but these buy signals are spread out. And so you get the effective turns when they're tight together. And that was, that was up here at 10,000. Right. The, the cycle trap turned over. You got a bearish RSI. You got to sell through the net line. You know, three signals all in two bars. That's Confl strong. Yeah, confluence. Yep. Yep. So that's right. that's also part of a, my approach and and the bread and butter that I do. You know, your approach is uh, fascinating to me, Chris. And you know, if you, you would like, uh, perhaps you could show your website and how people could subscribe to your work and or follow you on Twitter, uh, the best way for people to keep up with the spiral calendar, excellent esoteric work, and uh, a humble guide to boot. So, well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I take losses on my trades all the time. <laughs> okay. And we all do. And if people who don't admit it, run away from them. Yeah, oh, yeah spiralcalendar.com well, is the website. Yeah. And... Uh, all Lots right. more information there. And there's some free. You can read the chapter one of the book, the Spiral Calendar. Uh, you can read chapter one of the book there. And you know that book. It's been out 25 years, and the copies are starting to get scarce. If you don't have one, um, it, you might wow. want to add it to your bookshelf. Yeah, there won't be another edition, so it's going to. Well, end there's going to be there's going to be something, but I I don't think I'm going to reissue the the original book as is i think that was sort of a classic i think that there's going to be something but it'll be different and i want an autograph copy uh if you can get an uh, uh, yes um if you <laughs> order the book from amazon that? just shoot me an email and say i'd like it autographed and we can all right all right well chris uh thank you so much for coming back and i hope we could do it again maybe late summer early fall see what uh, the skies are telling you I encourage people to have an open mind to the rhythm of the universe that Chris Carolyn has the pulse of and some really interesting looks underneath the surface of either a candle or a bar so thanks again Chris for coming out of fire community and thanks for showing me the new correlation with gold I'll, I'll be making the most out of it uh, yeah, you're very welcome, Dale, and uh, I, I enjoyed our visits. Thank you so much, Chris. Good hunting. May pips rain down on you, my trading warrior brother. Thanks, Dale. All right, buddy. So that's a wrap for us here on Thursday. See everyone for the NFP tomorrow morning. And remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. Uh, I'll see you in the private chat. Blake's there, Steve's there. And have a great day. Good hunting everyone and I'll see you tomorrow. TGIF NFP.